Hi, and welcome to Genius Tea Time with Laura Young. Thank you so much for joining us. So in Laura's own words, Laura Young, she, they, is the Director of Enrollment Management at the UCLA School of Arts and Architecture. They have presented extensively on visual and performing arts college admissions at local, regional, and national levels for students, families, counselors, school districts, and nonprofit organizations. They were recognized by the National Association for College Admission Counseling with the Rising Star Award for these efforts. Young received their BA in Studio Art at UCLA and their Master's of Education at USC. So, dueling. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Laura. And this is great. And do you want to talk to us about the Art Prof and the Lineage Performing Arts Center, which are the organizations we're going to be sponsoring with this talk? Yes. Um, so the, the Art Prof is an online visual arts resource um, that was designed to support students who wanted to make art um, and maybe just had a piece of paper and a pencil. So it's super inclusive, um, doesn't require you to have any kinds of materials, but really is a creative community to learn about kind of how to make art, connect to other young people who love to make art um, and get ready for art school if you wanna do that kind of a thing. Neat. And then the Lineage Performing Arts Center is in Pasadena, California, and it's a full service performing arts um, place. And specifically, they do some really lovely movement work with the um, disabled community. And um, one of my very, my, my oldest friend from grade school is their executive director. Um, so that's my personal connection to the place. That is great. Thank you. And, and do you want to tell ever the world about the uh, your sock monkey? <laughs> to, I guess to keep it tea <laughs> we were, and get um, us started. Yeah, we were discussing this earlier. Um, I know that this is genius tea time, so I really wanted to start with tea because I actually I, I love tea. Um, so my favorite decaf is Tazo Wild Orange. And then I'm not a coffee drinker, so my favorite caffeinated tea is PG Tips. Um, and again, I've done yeah, my I've got some um, Anglophiles in my family, and my dad lived in England with his family when he was a teenager, and so we all have our our favorite black teas. And so I've I've tried the the Twinings and the Tetleys and the Red Rose and the Typhu and the Yorkshire and PG Tips is my favorite. Also, the sock monkey is funny. And I believe in starting things with humor. All good. It's perfect. What would you like to, where do you like to start? I'm going to start. Okay. Oop. Just moving some things around so I can see. Okay. So you did, uh, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Um, but here I am again. Um, so this the 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 who am I and and why should you care? So my title is as director of enrollment management. It's um, most people don't know what enrollment management is. It's specific to higher education. It's a thing, and it is a series of organizational strategies and influences in higher education around shaping and building a student community that also addresses institutional goals in a sustainable, equitable manner. So this includes outreach, recruitment, admission, financial aid, data analysis, information technology, curriculum, career education, development. Um, I got into this work entirely by accident. And this is a career where everybody who is an enrollment manager also gets into it kind of by accident or just by following their noses if they start working in higher ed and then kind of stumble upon things. Um, <laughs> But what's important is that I wouldn't be an enrollment manager uh, for, say, like a nursing program. Um, I grew up in a creative family. I am a creative person. Artists are my people. So it's a, um, a really special place for me to be. So that's kind of where my talk is about today, about creativity and higher education and just education in general and data analytics and culture and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so... 
this is in terms of like creativity and creative careers and money. I spend a lot of time in this space. So this is what I deal with all the time. I have always had to talk to people about postgraduate life in the admission process because of media like this. I've been doing this since 2005. Um, so creative careers, like if you, you like don't get an arts theory because you're not going to make money. Um, the training and the degree is irrelevant. It's not rigorous. It's not sensible. It's not realistic. You're marginalizing yourself. Um, your skill sets are going to be totally irrelevant. And the only way to be successful is to be famous. And if you are not famous, then it's a straight shot to the basement. There is like nothing in between. And all of this messaging has been really constant and pervasive. And I got suckered into it too um, as a young person, even though I had all the reasons not to. I had a tremendous amount of cultural, environmental, generational, financial privilege. And I still thought that this wasn't a thing that I could do. And also, it wasn't quite the thing that I wanted to do. Um, I like making and doing art, but I didn't want it to be the way that I made my living. And I had no idea what to do about that, even though I'm sure that I'm a creative person and that I'm good at what I do because I am a creative person. I still flinch a little bit when people learn that I have a BA in art and then they're like, oh, what do you make? And I'm like, Ooh. so in, in speaking about money, um, and, and talking about that and like, what, what do you do in exchange for this thing that you do? Um, I want to start by talking about this thing that I have to talk to a lot of adults about, like the adults associated with the students about return on investment. So return on investment is the approximate measure of profitability. So if I spend this much money on a degree, then I expect that when I graduate, I will have been trained in a certain way and the skills that I've learned will translate into a certain amount of earnings potential. And ROI is calculated primarily off of people who work nine to five jobs and their earnings are not reported by their employer. And this really is gets very complicated when you're talking about creative workers because they earn money irregularly, quote unquote, AKA not a nine to five 40 hour work week. They have a changing workflow and are poly occupational which is a much nicer way and a much more accurate way of saying working multiple jobs, because that's the thing that everybody's worried about. Like, oh, if you're going to be a creative person, you have to work multiple jobs, many jobs, with the assumption that within the framework of the nine to five, it sounds terrible. Like you're going to go work a 40 hour work week in a thing, and then you're going to come home and you're going to do another thing. But that's not usually the case. Time is much more flexible and much more controllable for creative earners. So when you have an entire group of people who are unique in terms of labor data, who have a distinct talent for not working a nine to five, their money stories don't get told accurately. So you get these people who work for weeks for a paid contract, and then they might switch to a non-arts job between gigs. They invest full time in an artistic project and then get paid for it once it's completed. They might work continuously as an artist part time and keep another occupation. All of those people, and this actually goes for anybody who doesn't work a nine to five, gets done really, really dirty by ROI. So, like, look, look at like we're a very you know, a very capable bunch of people, you know, again, kind of going back to the other slide where you have a majority of people who are working, you know, who are self-employed, who are extremely professional in their multiple jobs, um, you know, three, you know, more than three times more, more likely than other workers to be self-employed. And we're also extremely well-educated um, another statistic that I like a lot is 16% of creative people started their own business compared to 4% of the general population. Like we're a very, very capable bunch. Um, and I want to point this out in terms of like a story time and visuals, because these are the majority of my friends. And I'm going to highlight somebody who I know, who's a friend of mine. So most of my friends are creative workers. Um, and this is the way that they earn money. So they are earning you know, this is a yearly kind of year annual, annual income, where as a photographer, they're earning about 50K a year. 
they're doing some marketing work at around 80K per year. And then they run a kind of a studio manager, sort of landlord type situation for about 40K. And what ROI does when you disaggregate my friend's earnings by industry and occupation, it splits out the photography money, which if you just look at photography, somebody, you know, you might be looking at people who are earning like 10K a year, 50K, 80K, 30K, but it's not going to look a lot once you add it all up. And then if you split it all out, then it looks like not so much across all of those categories. So the assumption is that based off of a sole income source, which is not the whole picture, then this is what happens when you put all of your friends' money together. This is what happens. So this is the majority of non-famous people in the middle of being famous and the basement. So what I want you to think about is like watching a movie. So who's the star? Who is the visible person's face on the billboard? And then I want you to think about the credits and all of those people. And those people are the regular people and those are the stories that are missing. So you have like an architect who draws comic books. You have a graphic designer who teaches life sciences to pre-med students. The attending physician who has a painting studio, the law school dropout who runs a fashion label for Ms. Garage. I mean, these are all real people who I know, and most of them are clearing six-figure salaries. They have partners, they have children, and they own property. And the good news is, one of the tiny good things to come out of the pandemic, and because of the rise in gig work, the Department of Labor has finally realized that they do a terrible job in tracking these earnings, and they're working hard to update their reporting structures. So for everyone who gigs, we're going to have a more accurate data picture in the nearest future, hopefully. So really looking forward to that. But for now, this is actually a thing that's happening. So in speaking about like, my goodness, like how can creative people be good at everything? When you zoom out, since we tend to talk about creativity as the inherent domain of artists, Creativity is much more expansive than that. So when you're teaching, you know, when I'm talking to students about how to recognize, guide, and cultivate creativity in themselves and in community, it's a really, really critical skill. So in looking at creative literacy, this is where somebody is an expert in expression. So what we feel, what we think, what we hope, what we desire across a variety of spectrums, you know, these are people who can make a piece of music without any words that makes us cry. Like, I can watch my friend who's a dancer and she moves her arm in a certain way. And like, I feel sadness. And like, how on earth can somebody know how to do that? It's because they're really, really in touch with all of the feelings in all of the ways and are incredibly empathetic. And so what they're doing is they're letting you know that you're not by yourself and that I understand you, you're not alone, you're a part of a group of people. And that's the acknowledgement that's happening there, which is so important. And people just don't realize that this constant searching for an assignment of meaning dwells in everybody. And then the creative person is the person who exercises this muscle regularly enough to be able to control it. So this is getting taught in, in schools. So this data is from my favorite data set. I have a favorite data set <laughs> um, from the Strategic National Arts Alumni Project, which is graduates of arts programs um, from high school, from undergrad, from grad have reported that they learn. And beyond their specific artistic skill, like these are all the transferable skills that they're learning. And these findings span responses from students who are 10, 20, 30 years out from school. And this is what they've identified as what they've learned. So this points to this particular type of training that's been happening for a really long time. And then that really measures up nicely with the job outlooks from the National Association of Colleges and Employers. So this is a survey that's done of all of these entry-level employers saying, what are the top five or eight attributes that you're looking for in your entry-level hires? Problem solving, it's kind of, you got to squint up a little bit, but problem solving skills, the ability to work in a team, 
strong work ethic, analytical and quantitative skills, communication skills, like, uh-huh, uh-huh. It lines up really nicely. And then how do those skills translate into real life? When we're broadening the discussions of what it means to be creative, this is what the creative economy looks like. So this is actually a graphic from an urban revitalization project um, in New Mexico. You know, this, sometimes with like economic development offices, they don't, these, these graphs can be a little bit ugly. This was the least ugly one, um, but it's actually a really good layout of the larger framework of the creative economy, which always includes technology and business every single time. And that's something that has always been very separate from these discussions of creativity in terms of like when you're selecting a college major, it gets very, very bifurcated. Um, and so I spend a lot of time thinking about how to connect the dots for people. You know, we have this idea of the artist as this like eccentric genius who works alone, very much a cult of personality when that is not the only way to be creative and making art in capitalism feels like a departure from community. And going to college for so many feels like a departure from their community, which is really intense because you need your community in order to make art. Going back to what arts grads learn, like critical thinking, problem solving, like working together, your people matter. And creative and cultural entrepreneurs, so like storytellers, innovators cannot exist in a vacuum. They need this ecosystem in order to thrive. And you need a place in order to be able to plug into a cultural and creative economy. So you have your guardians and your stewards to protect, support, and amplify the creative and cultural entrepreneurs. So what does it mean when art making and creativity is colored by colonialism? And I think about this all the time because I actually do work with a few programs who are really trying specifically in areas of performance and cultural studies and they're deliberately approaching from a non-Western decolonized framework. So I see in real time how students do not know that they can go to college for dance if they've come from, say, social dance traditions, as opposed to like ballet. That if your creative practice is food, plant medicine, religion, spirituality, social customs, philosophy, these are like things in higher education that you can connect to and do. And so one of my, one of my favorite people is Joe Rohde. And as long as we're talking about storytelling and community, um, he recently retired from Disney and he was arguably their most famous employee at Walt Disney Imagineering. His title was something like super nebulous, like senior vice president creative um, but he really dealt with experience design at theme parks. So research and development, he travels all over the place. Like his earring is like trinkets that he's gotten from everybody all over the place. And one of my favorite conversations with him, he talked about how he builds his teams and he likes to hire people from everywhere. He wants like people who do specific stuff like theme park design um, and then engineers, architects, historians, political scientists. And he's like, I need everybody on my team. I need the theme park designers for their very specific expertise in this thing. And then I need everyone else. Like I need the art history people, for example, because they understand what I'm talking about when I say that the shadows in this part of the jungle over here need to look Dekirico-esque. So that's De Chirico. He was an Italian Greek painter. Um, and De Chirico, one of his big quotes is, what is especially needed is great sensitivity to look upon everything in the world as an enigma, to live in the world as in an immense museum of strange things. And, you know, for all of this, like, emphasis that I run into about you know, study engineering, study business, study engineering, study business, so you can make a bunch of money right away. We actually do have data um, saying that liberal arts graduates start with lower salaries, but catch up really quickly to STEM and business grads. Um, 
and arts and humanities graduates report a high level of job satisfaction right out of the gate. Like 87% of these workers were satisfied with their jobs. So like the happiness part hits right away. And I do get that some folks have to hit the ground running in turn because STEM, STEM does pay a lot like right out of the gate. But something else that Joe said was when I see people with specialized degree, usually they like come right out and they go, they, their careers accelerate really quickly, but then they plateau. And with the humanities and arts people, it's like, but it keeps going up forever. So I think that this idea that you can grow and change and shift really needs to be talked about. And as a final thought, all of these reports are coming out right now about what sectors are the most susceptible to automation. So is a robot going to steal your job? There is literally a website called willrobotstakemyjob.com. Um, and the arts are extremely robot proof because they require a high level of expertise specifically in areas of you need to be able to be unpredictable and suspend your judgment, which is what artificial intelligence thrives on. Like that's what artificial intelligence does is it's a predictive model, but creative people know how to step outside of that algorithm. So having that particular skill is super important in terms of job security in the future. So that's what I have to say. And then, you know, because we got to we got to get that money. Um, you know, I I think all of us here in California and this this home state of mine is the fifth largest GDP in the world, not just in the United States but in the world. So this is a huge deal. Um, this is our main, you know, creativity and that kind of and cultural exports are a huge part of um, our output as a state. Now, you know, there is good information out there and more to come about the earning power of the creative class. But since I work at a college and in a system that services a good deal of first generation college goers, their status as first gen also affects their choices of major and postgraduate career. And I'm gonna, I know it's, I know it's a lot. This is as, as not busy as I could have made this information. Um, this information is from one of my favorite things. It's an interactive article that was published a few years ago on Vox.com that's all about college mobility culture, and it places in contrast the reasons why first-generation students choose college versus continuing generation students. And they differentiate their reasons as either independent or interdependent. And first generation students have far more interdependent reasons to choose college as opposed to continuing generation students. And I hear these reasons reflected to me in my counseling. So tying back to this idea of the working artist as this eccentric loner genius, that's an added layer of challenge when this population already feels like they're rejecting their past and community by going to college in the first place. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go down the data rabbit hole that has to do with like gender, race, ethnicity, et cetera, around college going culture, although I could. Um, but I will say that while women are seeking higher education more than men, their earning power is hobbled when they graduate. And same with Black, Indigenous, people of color, Latinx, as, a, as compared to white men. So it's not a big leap when you see studies like this and think that there are a host of factors that are keeping so many valuable perspectives out of the arts due to social, cultural, educational, and financial barriers. And again, here, this study in particular notes the lack of nuance in the American Community Survey from which this data is gleaned as the survey does not collect on non-binary, gender non-conforming, transgender, and agender people. And sometimes it feels like we have all the data in the world, but not really. Um, and as I think about money and creative people and how to help them, these days I'm interacting with a lot of people who have MBAs and they're suggesting all of these books by MBA, like that MBA people read in MBA school. And I get like really 
like I have this huge reaction and then I have to think about why, because they aren't talking about anything new. When I started in my work, the big thing was this article by Daniel Pink. He's an economic policy dude. Um, he was the special assistant to Secretary of Labor Robert Reich, and then he was a chief speechwriter for Vice President Al Gore, and he published in the Harvard Business Review called this article called The MFA is the New MBA. And the more that I interact with thought leaders and entrepreneurship as they're talking about creativity, I'm like, well, like, duh, of course, like every single creative person I know already knows all of this stuff. So naturally, I think about all the reasons why we're not leveraging. You know, do we not want to interact with capitalism because we're so deeply aware of how much violence it's done to our communities and we'd rather maintain our relationship with our communities. And then I also run across things like this, like this little tiny study out of Germany where literally like artists don't have the same dopamine response to money as non-creative people. Um, and then, so they measured like brain activity and like showed them a bunch of lights and they found that artists showed significantly reduced activation in the brain reward system. And then when they, and then another thing was that they ran a second test and showed that the artists had a greater response in another dopamine related part of the brain when they were told to reject the money. So like, and this was a teeny study. It was like 24 people. But the, the idea that it's like hard-coded in our brains, like as created people to get less worked up about receiving money is really ties into a lot of these discussions about like somatics and aesthetic. Like I have so much trouble from with like money discussions, almost from like an aesthetic framework. Because, like there's this book called The Soul of Money by Lynn Twist. And I was listening to, you know, like a podcast with Oprah and I had to push through so much to listen to the whole thing because of like white saviorism and the chicken soup for the soul sensibility. It just, like as a creative person, I was like, mm, like I can't handle this. And I think now I think about it, like, did I avoid reading Suze Orman because I didn't like the color of her spray tan? Like, none of this is poetic. Like, look at this guy. This is Stephen Covey, who wrote this very, very famous, you know, bestseller called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And all of these are principles are exactly what creative people do. Like, if you read it, like even just the Wikipedia summary, I'm like, well, but like, I just like, I do this. Like, what do you, like all of the people I know do this like already. And the th something right now these days that brings me an immense amount of joy is that there are so many more different kinds of people talking about money. I have never seen conversations like this in my career, specifically in the realms of money trauma because this is an actual thing affecting people around my age and younger. Um, I'm an elder millennial, I'm 42. Um, like we've been traumatized by capitalism and chronic economic instability on, on like a body level. And we feel like we can't ask for anything. So this is actually a somatic challenge on top of everything else for us. Like our brains work in a particular way. Our bodies are like now encoded because of our social experiences. Um, but as somebody who works at a college, like Gen Z is really different. You know, they want to touch grass and they want soft lives and we all deserve that. And I love it. And here are some of my favorite people who are talking about money, who I can like actually personally identify with as a creative anti-capitalist person of color, which is like incredible that now here comes the time where people are talking about this. And, you know, even in this moment, like one of the things that made me so like weirded out about giving this presentation is that like me too, like I've given some form of this presentation for at least the past decade or so. And even though I'm technically not getting paid to give this presentation, this is the first time to my knowledge anyway, where there has been a charge or donation in exchange for me talking about this content. So I'm actually grappling with these idea of like shared labor, 
consumption, mutual aid, and like being consumed in real time. And, you know, and like for everybody here and for everybody who's watching this at whatever time, like, you know, I have these conversations all the time and you're amazing and it doesn't occur to you like so often. Like I remember talking to a friend of mine who like a creative friend of mine who bought a house like from the bottom up, like no help from family, no inheritance, no partner. It was all them like a hundred percent with money that they made as a costume designer, like a whole house in Los Angeles. Like it's a miracle. And they had a housewarming party and the house was cute and their dog was cute. And I'm like, dude, like you bought your own house. And they were like, eh. and then I go and I tell high school and college students about that story. And they're like, oh my God, amazeballs. Like, how did they do it? So like, just because you would do the thing for free and because we feel like we can't take all the credit because we're part of a community that makes everything that we do possible, like to not let that stop me or you or anyone from acknowledging that you can be inspirational. And these are actually, this is the part of like my call for this. Like, these are the stories that I do want to be able to amplify some way, somehow. Like I want to be able to create a place where people can interact with nuanced, culturally competent, community connected financial narratives about poly occupational creatives and especially black indigenous asian latinx native folks under the age of 50 so if i'm manifesting anything in this moment like that's it um because it's really needed so that's that's what i got there's my contact information and I did put together a Google Doc of all of the little citations that I talked about today. So if you want to go be an extra nerd and like go read all the stuff over there, you totally can. But I would love to talk to you and thank you so much. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Um, can you put the, um, the Google Doc also into the chat? I can. I can. Yay. All right. Get out of here. Yeah, we could do. But thank you. That was lovely. Um, please, um, Rebecca and uh, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? You can also pop them in the chat if you'd like. Um, I'm getting the link. Are, are you are you seeing the chat too, Laura? I am. All right. And yes, that is a fabulous Audre Lorde quote. Very nice. There's the tiny Earl. Tiny Earls. Oh, this is lovely. Um, do you, Rebecca, do you remember Laura from working from at UCLA? Uh, I don't. <laughs> it's, it's really okay. It's like, <laughs> Probably feels like years and years and years ago. It was Thanks so much for joining. Us. My yeah. goodness. Like, I mean, that time, I mean, A, that was 25 years ago. Yeah. It doesn't uh, occur to me because I'm always talking to, um, like, it doesn't, it doesn't, I, I just talk to people and they're always, you know, about 17 or 18 years old. And then it doesn't occur to me that, like, I'm getting older because they're the same age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, that's there awesome was, there was this one moment a number of years ago where I was talking to this kid who was wearing you know he was a sophomore in high school and wearing a sublime t-shirt and we were talking about music and I said oh like I saw sublime in like 93 or something and he said yeah well like I'm my Bradley Noel's son is my best friend in high school I was like oh. Like, ooh, <laughs> how much time has passed like <laughs> dang uh, well yeah like i got t you know the students that i talked to like i got t-shirts older than you and i actually like <laughs> and then i tell them oh i was alive in the actual 90s yes no really dude <laughs> so this is this is it's so much fun because when i do zoom calls it's I'll sometimes drop that in there and there's always somebody in the in the in the grid where they're like 
in the yeah. actual 90s, man. Yeah. <laughs> the actual 90s. Ooh. That reminds me of a much version, old, older version of the same story. Um, when I was teaching ceramics in Ithaca in 1994, um, so, you know, we were all, you know, talking about being alive in the 90s. I was married by then. Um, I was teaching this group, this mixed age group of kids at this private place. And I had this one lovely young teenage guy who was just adorable in so many ways and was so excited. And he was really into, into music. And I brought in an English beat CD and because I thought he would really like it, right? Because it was like, early 90s and there was sort of this rehash of ska kind of stuff and I played it for him and he's like who's that and um I said seeing English beat and I'm like I thought you would know about them from everything you seem to know about music and he's like mm, when were they popular and I'm like well I think this album came out in like 81 and he's like dude I wasn't born then and that was what I was sort of reminded it's the exact same thing right like and it sticks with you right that like Someone was saying recently, you know, like Dark Side of the Mood is 50 years old this year. You know, yeah. ridiculous things. Yeah, I introduced a, a student came up to see me showing me a film project and they did all the music to it. And I said, oh, it sounds like craft work. And they're like, what? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm going to blow your mind right now. Mm -hmm. um, and... I said they were more like they, you know, like arguably more popular than the Beatles in in their time, and they're just like sometimes listening. continuing to be. Yeah, <laughs> like just they're like listening and listening and listening. And so I can hear everything in here. I can hear hip hop. I can hear. I'm like, yeah, yeah. It's the birth. <laughs> so you're welcome. Um, go forth and yes. know that what what you're doing like has a has a place. But they, they're just like bombarded with so much information right now that being able to curate it is a I don't I wouldn't want that challenge like I have enough yeah. trouble as it is it's it's a big one what do you find when you're um doing these I, I don't know like are you doing like, talks with the students and their parents so, like at one-on-one -on -one? is the, are these in groups how do you handle that with admissions I mean with this I kind of foist it on them um, <laughs> because I feel like it's a really important discussion. And I'm also privileged to be able to do it because most of my colleagues in arts programs are just trying to shake the trees to get students where I, you know, we get, a pl we get enough applications to our programs. Um, so that's not really a big emphasis in what I do, but like, I, I know that this is a secret fear of theirs because it always comes out in the Q&A like 20 minutes in as I'm about to leave, you know? And they're like, S but, but like, what do you do after you graduate? So I just, I sometimes will, I very often start my presentations about, can I please like recalibrate you right at the beginning? And I need to talk about this thing that's very clearly on your mind because I need you to not have this, huge like sucking vacuum sound of what am I going to do with this shit after I graduate while I'm trying to talk to you about like best practices for the audition or portfolio because everything colors that like you first need you and your adults need to first feel really comfortable with the idea that this is a good idea and that you like you need to do this. Like there is a place for you. It's valuable. And um, yeah, like it's, it's not stupid. It's not stupid or unreasonable or, or not sensible or anything. And it's a really interesting, I'm wondering how it's going to kind of pan out now that we're going into another recession. Because when I first started in college admissions in 2005, I would get adults in front of me like straight up saying to my face I don't want my kid majoring in the arts I want them to do something sensible I want them to do like business or engineering or something like that and then the recession the great recession hit in 2008 
and those conversations completely ended overnight. Microsoft is laying off 5,000 people today. Like that was no longer sensible. So, and those discussions have never really returned, but they are kind of like they're creeping back. Like do STEM, do business, do STEM, do business. Like, hmm. Um, speaking as somebody who's got, went through shifting a lot of gears during the last recession and several. <laughs> and do you want um, to talk to all my friends who just got laid off from Meta? Yeah, like a lot of people in the arts, shifting is what you do. <clears throat> shifting in, in creative fields of any kind, and I include a lot of entrepreneurship in that. Shifting is what you do. It's what you have to do in order to make anything work. So you might be better designed for it than say the people who are being laid off at JPL. JPL is not laying people off. Well, oh bless their hearts. Well, they they did for at least some of the people that I was working with, but um, yeah. there was a brief period. I mean, that's, yeah. it's we still have a very fundamental conversation to have about what our government supports and what kind of, you know, what, where money is actually given and, um, you know, the difference between, like, if somebody gets laid off from JPL, there's going to be another job for them. Whereas, you know, I mean, all the conversations you and, have, you and I have had, Laura, about like gig economy within the entertainment industry and the exhaustion level. And, you know, like I just discovered that because I was not doing a job that provided social security for the last 10 years, I'm not eligible to apply for SSI as a now chronically ill person. So like our government has just basically doesn't, pays no attention to the fact that, um, that I, I'm, I can't make, I can't do the work. I'm going to have to refigure out what I'm going to do completely. And I think that that's a conversation that we, we are going to need to start talking about because also a lot of things in the arts are super toxic, which is something Laura and I have talked about. Um, and we expect people to do those things um, and to be willing because they're, you know, committed to their to their visions. Um, so like I'm I'm interested in those kinds of conversations at this point. Like, how are we, you know, what will be the case in terms of long COVID as people do get laid off and we don't have, I, mean, I don't know that single payer is the answer, but I don't know what the answer is, but I do, you know, my husband and I have talked about what happens when he retires. I'm not going to be any less ill, right? Like what kind of we, acrobatics we, are they going to go through to try and avoid supporting you? Because yeah, people with right? chronic illness and there's so many more of them now. Yeah, um, I'm already um, seeing yeah. our insurance, which is supposed to be, you know, a, this, you know, premier PPO, you know, through Caltech, they're denying things for me that they wouldn't, that they didn't deny a couple of years ago. Uh, because, and I've been told by all my doctors, insurance is denying things left and right because long, because COVID cost them everything. Um, so, I mean, like how we figure out how to put these things together you know, if even if we are piecing together jobs, and even if we do find ways to do six figures, which I've never personally seen that, like outside of having regular jobs, I don't know what that means for our health, or our mental health, or our aging population. So, and that is definitely not something that was talked about when I was in grad school at UCLA, no. right? That's, All those things. that's a, you know, that was a piece that I was speaking about um, with somebody who I met who's worked freelance, like she and her husband is, have worked freelance their entire lives. And she's like, when I tell you how difficult it was to get approved for a mortgage, because, you know, even, even though my husband and I like have been clearing six figures separately for over a decade, the fact that we both worked freelance and weren't tied to like a place of employment that alone was like, Oh my gosh, you're unpredictable. Therefore we can't, we can't do this thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I mean, then, you know, as, as I dig more into it, just like, Oh, delightful. Another, another area of discrimination. Definitely. Yeah. 
you know, and how we're going to look at all of that. I mean, I think the fundamental point is that people who have creative mindsets are willing to look outside the box, willing to think creatively about solutions for things. And that's something that I'm committed to. But I don't, I don't like, I would never tell my own kid to go into the arts. And I've been at it for a very long time, a very long time. Um, and I would never tell him to do it because it, it is too unpredictable. And I mean, already, you know, I don't think he'll ever be able to buy a home in this city. You know, I've been telling people that I know that make $350,000 that the best idea is to buy a plot of land near me for $250,000, put a small, put a tiny house on it and then slowly figure out what kind of building they want and then build it in sections. Mm -hmm. Those are the people, people who make that much money cannot afford to buy in this city, which is gonna make this city a very different place uh, because you know, 30 years ago, a lot of people moved out of Manhattan, moved out here and it redefined you know, where the creative capital was um, but a lot of those people have now like moved out to Joshua Tree, they've moved to Santa Fe, they've moved almost anywhere else. Um, because the next generation is not going to be able to live here. And I don't know what that's going to mean for everything. This leads really interestingly into the conversation we're going to have with Abigail Batson yeah. in a little bit, who's a really super, hi everybody. I'm so sorry. I was out of cell service. I will... Oh no. Very excited to watch. The, we just had a crazy adventure that I will tell you about, not on this recording, but we were stuck like out of cell service, which I was not anticipating at all. And so I'm very excited to watch the recording of this talk. Oh. Uh, yeah, Abby is a, a real estate person whose great love is talking people through the process of buying a first home and who is about as on top of real estate in LA as anyone I have ever met or, or spoken to. And it's just like a, a wellspring of kindness and has has some real can-do metal in her. And I just appreciate it. And I'm appreci appreciating that she contacted us and was like, hey, would this be useful? I was like, Fuck that. Yeah. useful to me. Like, yeah, I want to have that conversation. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, all of that. Yeah, my, one of my former students, Mahnoor, who was here earlier, um, you know, she just got out of a, you know, just got out of an MFA program at, at, in film at USC and um, has been, her film's been winning at film festivals. So she's like now eligible for the Oscars, which is dope. And she, but she's just like, can I buy a house here in Los Angeles? Like my parents are here. Like, I don't know if I can, it's like, I don't know if I can, she's like, I thought I wanted four kids. I'm like, and you okay like I don't think you want to hear everything that I have to hear about um what it means to have a child in America um because that's a whole other presentation which I could give <laughs> um yeah I mean my husband is a manager he's a group supervisor at JPL right he's a PhD he's been there almost 30 years um and he is having trouble hiring the best candidates who are coming out of PhD programs because they cannot buy homes anywhere near JPL. He's got people living in Palmdale. He's got people living over an hour away. He's got people living like out in the hinterlands saying, you know, like, um, we'll just telecommute, right? And he's arguing with HR to keep them because they cannot buy anything and they're so, coming you know these are the conversations like that we're gonna that are gonna really affect um you know our future this is where a discussion about collectivist models gets really interesting for me like what happens if we collectively stop engaging with insurance companies but form collectives with healthcare providers mm -hmm. yes you know, like what happens if we collectively buy property and we abandon this notion of like the white picket fence that just belongs to you and you alone? Yes. Yeah. And, and that's what I've been seeing in the way people are are subverting the entire model. And that's mm -hmm. one of the better choices um, going I through the commercial property route. I mean, unless you're going to emigrate to a place with universal basic health care and like, you know, just uh, the, the basics that people need just to make life work at all. 
like mm -hmm. the fact that you could become ill and lose everything you have in America makes it really unsustainable for anyone except like the fantastically wealthy. Mm -hmm. But like, even that, they, like, I don't know if people really realize how close to poverty they actually are. Because if, if the hospital collapses, how much money do you actually have to have in order to be able to duplicate that kind of a resource? It's, in, even, it's intense. Yeah, like, and I don't, and, and I do, you know, I don't think people think about, I, I don't think that people with money think about that at all. It's like, I mean, the, con the concentration of wealth within hospitals also is just fucking insane and there's no legal structure to prevent it. Cedar sinai alone makes upwards of $7 million a day in only surgeries. No other service, just surgeries mm -hmm. at one hospital. And there's no standardizing of the big... pricing, none. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a whole other, right? Like, <laughs> trust me. Yeah, I'm clear on that one. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right, Pamela. And then we are gonna have to really rethink all of these ideas, right? Um, I mean, I've been really excited to be talking about like, you know, women buying property collectively and dividing it up and like figuring out, you know, how do you read to do uh, living wills and trusts and things if you are a collection of 70 plus year old women who are looking out for each other right and who have made a decision because they are going to live longer right to wrap to do wrap around for each other you know it's easier in some states. it's what it's much easier in some states than in others yeah in maine apparently super easy hmm. new york okay. not, california not easy yeah hmm. but doable it just takes a lot of like legal loophole working it seems yeah but definitely laura to your point i mean this is where you need that kind of creative training and where you need people who can think about things in a way that's more adaptable and limber <laughs> for lack of a better term more yeah. agile because if you were thinking in only one area and only one arena you are not going to be able to figure things out when something like for example your economy collapses when the housing market tanks you know I, and the, these are things that happen so the notion of st stability is is so laughable in a lot of ways yeah. like even like i'm waiting for my hoa to arrange for a plumber that because our water pressure is such that our washing machine doesn't work and they're like do, 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 do. Like, <laughs> this like this i don't think you understand that with two small children how much i need the wa working washing machine and <laughs> and it's like I'm doing everything right and yet it's not working I mean this is like when people get married and, yeah I, you know I watch people get married and they're like but we made a promise and it's supposed to go this one way you know it just doesn't go that way for everybody you know there's no fucking guarantees I mean you're talking about the water thing I mean um the line we had a break in our irrigation line that was in the valves and didn't know it last summer and we didn't know it until we got a three thousand dollar dwp bill ouch yeah so you know <laughs> like and they were like you need to just pay this and i was like why did i get a three thousand dollar it was actually thirty six hundred dollars uh -huh. um and i was like yeah that's that's easily more than three times what I'm used to, like even on our property. And um, so I spent, my husband went through everything and finally figured out what it was, um, getting that fixed. And then um, there were two other breaks in the line from the street to our house. Um, I have spent about $3,000 in the last four months just fixing things like that. 
It's yes. my problem. I was able, I mean, I was lucky like that one of the things that broke at the same time as our back irrigation broke was this front line that also broke. And so I could show that. I, I, I queried the hive mind and they told me that, yes, yeah, sometimes if this happens, you can plead, you know, you can like plead a, a, a break in all of this from like, it's not mine it's over there no I, I so the guy came out I showed him where the break was in the front yard which is from which was in the copper from the sewer to the house and I showed him you know the $500 that I paid a plumber to fix it and they gave us a break on half of what the water would be so I still ended up paying an extra thousand dollars plus the 500 to fix it plus um we ended up buying, there's these things called flume, which are like wireless meters that you stick onto your water meter that will tell you when there's a leak. So now my husband like monitors that religiously. And anytime there's anything, he's like, okay, we find it, we find it, we find it. But I mean, there are a million ways in which a, a city that was built very fast and without a lot of thought is falling apart in ways that will be contingent on you know the rest of us to deal with um yeah, with frankly criminal water rights <laughs> yeah yeah everywhere but it's yeah we're gonna need agility we're gonna need agile thinkers everywhere yes agreed and hey Thank you so much for doing this. This is amazing. We're we're about up on the hour mark, but if there's something else that anyone would like to bring up other than what it's like to be living in Los Angeles at this time, <laughs> this very expensive time. I just think we need to figure out how as creatives, we're gonna do things like mutual aid for each other, how we're gonna be yeah. doing this and how are we going to be teaching these kinds of skill sets within our creative education programs. Yeah. Um, and that's something that yeah. I'm sort of hoping that that can, that like, can come up at UCLA. Cause I mean, it certainly didn't when I was there, right? Like we were just like, it's a studio based program. We did studio art for three years. We got feedback on it and then we were out. There was, yeah. I mean, I'm very lucky that I had a previous degree in journalism and then I had done years in fundraising at an Ivy league. So I had some idea of like grant writing. I had some idea of how to write essays. I had some idea of how to do my own statement cause that never came up once in grad school. I mean, I'm starting to train my daughter in financial literacy and she's not yet eight. Yes. Because I just want her to know and to not yeah. feel at like eight. you're, you know, the budget is a moral document. And I think that people totally. are really kind of afraid of that idea of like personalizing money because then you like personalize the evil. Like you think like, oh, this, you know, money, like this is going to fuck everything up. Um but and I and I I'm certainly guilty of it like I'm just gonna live on just enough and I you know I look back on it and I'm like I don't know how much I don't know how much that served me you know mm -hmm. um yeah that's the one sometimes sometimes students ask me like if you could go back and do it again what would you do I'm like fucking like I would take I would take a finance class and I would learn how to invest that's what I would do yeah that's and study abroad. That's the other thing. Even Straight. though I had really good reasons for not studying abroad, um, but like do that because being able to like live someplace for eight weeks gets a hell of a lot harder to manage logistically um, after you leave college. So if you have yeah. that opportunity, a lot of colleges now are like requiring study abroad. Like it's part of their curriculum, which is dope. That's um, great. Yeah, which I love a lot, but like, yeah, like get get a handle on the finances, but they're not, they're not afraid of it. Um, and they're not as resistant in terms of like the curriculum, because, you know, because I'm administration and not faculty, sometimes that's a place where I'm like, what do you like, how are you talking about this? Like, what's, what's going on in there? Like, what are you teaching on the Friday afternoons? Mm -hmm. um, my interaction more so is with um, the career center because they actually do now have a person and they have had one for a couple of years where it's somebody who likes is our is our liaison like works specifically with all the visual and performing arts majors at ucla 
So they do a lot of work to kind of like understand our needs. They usually, they themselves have a major or a minor in a visual and performing arts area. So they understand kind of the, the work and the culture. Um, and, you know, and they want to bring that out to the larger community of like, what does it mean to be a creative person? Mm -hmm. Which I really, well, I, I love to see it. Yeah. Um, whether or not they actually have a lot of time for it sometimes remains to be seen, but like I call them and I send them stuff all the time. So they can't say that I'm not, I'm not part of the interaction. So the actual teaching part, I'm just like, Oh, huh, interesting. <laughs> and weirdly, like something that I'm, I'm very much interested right now because we have this odd little major, this humanities research-based program that isn't a studio program called world arts and cultures. And I love cultures. That's where that's where all the cool shit is happening. I feel like it's so difficult for people to understand what it is because it's not like a studio program. Like you're not. They're like, what is this hippie shit? You know, it's not like it's you the, come yep. out like you're not coming out being able to like draw or dance or act or something like that. No, but you're coming out able to sense make in an informed way. Yes, I know, but that's that's where art is a moral action lives. Like that's that's where I all the know. like I know that. And the the thing is, like, so many of their graduates, like I went, I've been going through LinkedIn and looking up everybody. They're in big tech, like they're doing like DEI consulting. They are doing MBA programs, like they're getting into all, you know, dealing with like food justice on like policy levels. I'm like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you want to, everybody's scrambling to have DEI consultants, like name your price, go out and get that money. Yeah. Little hippies. For real. 